Let's play a game using this bomb and this map. You have to drop the bomb somewhere, and your goal is to harm as few people as possible. Wherever you choose to drop this bomb, everyone within a 90 mile radius will perish. Where do you choose to drop it? You can pause the video here and decide. Maybe you chose to drop the bomb in the middle of nowhere, like central Wyoming or northeastern Montana. Maybe you went to central Nevada, in the middle of the desert. And these are all good guesses, but they're not the correct answer. The best place to drop the bomb is right here, in southeastern Oregon. If the bomb were to detonate here, only around 2,000 people would die. Now this might surprise you, because Oregon has like 4 million people, but nearly 90% of them live in the western half of the state, and most of the rest live along I-84 in the northeast corner. So today, we're going to take a look at southeastern Oregon, and what makes it so empty and so special. In this video, I'm going to talk a lot about history. And I know this is like a geography video, but in a place like Southeast Oregon, the history and the geography are so intertwined that you can't ignore one and just talk about the other. And to start with history, we have to start with the Northern Paiute. The Northern Paiute were the most prominent tribe in the area when European fur trappers made contact in the 1800s. They lived a semi-nomadic lifestyle. They gathered pine nuts in the forests at high elevations. They went down to streams and rivers to catch trout. They hunted big game. They were all over the area, all through the Great Basin. Like the rest of North America, the trajectory of this place changed immensely when Europeans began to settle the area. And it actually took a long time because the Oregon Trail kind of went around Southeast Oregon. And so you didn't see very many settlers until around the 1870s. And before we go any further, I'm going to go into the geography a bit, watch this, and then we'll come back. So this is the broad general area we're working with. In the top right, you can see Boise, Idaho. Top left, you can see Bend, Oregon. Now, if we go in this rectangle here and we zoom in on this area, this is southeast Oregon. This is the part of the country that we're dealing with here. And in the bottom left is Hart Mountain. And in the middle of the map is Steens Mountain. Both of these are fault block mountains, which means they're very long. They're like the length of, of a mountain range. Steens Mountain is like 50 or 60 miles long, I think, um, but it's one mountain. So anyways, south of Steens Mountain are the Pueblo Mountains and the Trout Creek Mountains. These are some smaller mountain ranges. And then far on the right are the Owyhee Mountains. These are mostly on the Idaho side, and these sort of serve as the eastern boundary for where we're looking. Moving on to valleys, here is the Catlow Valley. And here is the Pueblo Valley. Makes sense, they're in between the mountains. Notice that inside the Pueblo Valley is the Alvord Desert, which is really cool. We'll talk more about that later. Moving on to the hydrology of the region, we have the Owyhee River on the right side here and Malheur Lake uh, in the top middle. And the water that runs off of Malheur Lake is what feeds a lot of the agriculture in the area, as you can kind of see from the satellite view if we zoom in. Last but not least is the Donner und Blitzen River, which has a German name, kind of crazy. Uh, I'll explain that later. But this river flows from Steens Mountain down into the Malheur Lake, and it's pretty unique because there's a canal for a lot of it, um, for irrigation uh, of the farmland. But anyways, that's all for the map. We'll talk a lot about this stuff later, but this is just a helpful baseline, so as I talk about places, you'll know what I'm talking about. Back to the northern Paiute. They began to see more and more settlers after the Civil War, and conflicts for natural resources ensued. President Grant attempted to relocate them to the Malheur Reservation, but the area was relatively unfamiliar to the Paiute, and settlers continued to encroach on their land. Meanwhile, in California, a wealthy farmer named Dr. Hugh Glenn decided to expand his empire. He was already the largest wheat grower in California, owning over 50,000 acres in what is now Glen County. Does that name ring a bell, Dr. Glenn? Yeah. After running out of land in the Sacramento Valley, Glenn sent his trusty foreman north to the Catlow Valley. That man was Peter French. And in 1872, French took a few cowboys, a cook, and 1,200 head of shorthorn cattle and began the trek north to the Catlow Valley. French bought some land on the western slope of Steens Mountain. Now, quick geography lesson. Eastern Oregon is dry because it sits in the rain shadow of the Cascades. As winds coming off of the Pacific carry precipitation eastward, 
it gets deposited in the mountains and dry air is blown through to the other side. As you can see from this map, it's pretty much universal across Southeast Oregon, except for in one spot, Steens Mountain. Steens is shaped like a massive wedge. So not only is it tall enough to catch some of the moisture that makes it past the rain shadow, but nearly all of that precipitation gets funneled into the Donner und Blitzen River. And again, I'll explain that name later. On the east side, which is far too steep to catch much rain, we're left with the Alvor Desert, the driest part of the entire state. Think of it as like a rain shadow within a rain shadow. So anyways, Peter French settled down with his cattle in the Catlow Valley and started ranching. But he was more than just a salt-of-the-earth rancher. He was a shrewd businessman. He took advantage of the Homestead Act, which gave settlers free parcels of land by having his employees make claims and then purchasing the land from them. But his greatest chicanery revolved around a now obscure law called the Swamp and Overflow Act. This law allowed marshland to be purchased from the federal government at a very low rate. Peter French would build dams on the river to flood areas then call up government assessors and buy the land from them at a very low price. Then he would remove the dams and use that land to graze cattle. He intimidated other settlers in the area into leaving. He even just simply fenced off public land and claimed it as his. Peter French was ruthless. Meanwhile, back north on the Malheur Reservation, conflict between settlers and the Paiute and Bannock people began to boil over. War broke out between the U.S. Army and the tribes. The Indians rode south to Steens Mountain. They swooped upon French's ranch and shot his horse out from under him, but he was able to escape. French returned with a U.S. Army Cavalry Regiment, and the Indians were driven north, past Malheur Lake, where they were ultimately defeated. In the end, it didn't matter. French's antics caught up with him, and he was shot in the head by an angry local who was cut off from easily accessing his land. French was such an infamous figure in the area that a jury found his killer, Edward Oliver, not guilty. At the time of his death, the ranch was nearly 200,000 acres. Much of that land was sold off to investors and some ended up becoming what is now the Malheur Wildlife Refuge. French's legacy still lives on in the Catlow Valley. The town of French Glen is named for him and Dr. Glen, and some of his buildings, like the Peter French Round Barn, are still standing. In the decades after French, more settlers began to move in. By 1916, there were over 700 people living in the Catlow Valley. These homesteaders were Able to eke out a living, but life was better up by the town of Burns, where there was more money to be made logging and mining in the mountains of northeast Oregon. A mere 12 years later, in 1928, fewer than 100 people remained in the Catlow Valley. Today, most of the area is owned by the massive and remote Roaring Springs Ranch. But there's a lot more to southeast Oregon than just the Catlow Valley. Let's head east to the town of Jordan Valley, a small settlement near the Idaho border. Jordan Valley was not founded as a ranching community because in 1863, gold was found in Jordan Creek, a tributary of the Owyhee River. Jordan Valley grew concurrently with a bigger mining town called Silver City, deep in the Owyhee Mountains. Silver City was a lot more profitable, and so as the gold in Jordan Creek began to dry up, Jordan Valley moved to a pack station, where miners would wait for snow in the Owyhees to clear so they could go up and mine. Today, Silver City is a ghost town. Only a handful of people live there year-round. Meanwhile, Jordan Valley is a significant town in southeast Oregon, home to over 100 people. This is because as mining declined, Jordan Valley's residents transitioned to ranching. Then, the Basques moved in. The Basque people are an interesting and unique ethnic group who live in an area called the Basque Country, a region of Spain and France. They have their own culture and language, and some immigrated to the U.S. to settle the frontier and graze sheep. At one point, Jordan Valley was allegedly two-thirds Basque, Evidence of this still exists today. Right in the middle of town is a Basque handball court. Nearby is a Catholic church. Although the town still exists, the population has been steadily declining for the last half century. The town of Burns is actually the largest in this corner of the state, but culturally it aligns more with the northeast portion of Oregon. It was founded as a logging town, but in the 1990s the last lumber mill in the area closed. It's significant because it's where most of the cattle raised in the area ends up being sold. This is a map of Lake County. The county seat in red is the town of Lakeview. Harney County with Burns in red and Malheur County with Vale in red. These three massive counties make up the southeast corner of Oregon and combined they only have nine incorporated places. 
Most of Malheur County lives in the far north part of the county along the Snake River in the exurbs of Boise, Idaho. Most of Harney County lives within 30 minutes of Burns, and most of Lake County resides in Lakeview or the western portions of the county. So you're left with this huge chunk of just emptiness. So yeah, there wasn't some crazy nuclear fallout or volcanic eruption that emptied this place out. It's empty because the only viable business models are farming in the rare areas that are both flat and able to be irrigated and ranching. And ranching in the area is not like ranching on a grass prairie. Cows need to eat. Generally, you need between one and three acres of grass to feed a cow, but there isn't much grass in the high desert of Southeast Oregon, so you need a lot more land. According to a Cattlemen's Association president, quote, it takes six or 700 acres per cow in some cases out in dry Eastern Oregon to run one cow for a season. As a result, there's just a lot less population density when compared to other cattle ranching areas like Kansas or Texas. The sparseness of the area leads to some interesting quirks. Let's say your parents are the proud owners of Oregon Canyon Ranch, and they want to send you to public school. Where do you think your high school would be? Maybe in the town of Basque? Let's zoom in and, oh yeah, Basque isn't really a town. Oregon Valley Ranch is located within Harney County School District 1J. The district high school is Crane Union, nearly two hours away. To accommodate for having a school district the size of Massachusetts, Crane Union is a boarding school. Southeast Oregon is also not poised to grow in the future. There's no interstate highways through the area and no rail lines, not even freight rail. With no national parks, the tourism industry isn't large either. And yet, many locals would argue that these factors are what makes the area so great. It's rugged, and if you can't handle it, you leave. As someone who's visited the area a couple times, I'm always amazed at just how much there is to see in such an empty area. The Donner und Blitzen River is a national wild and scenic river. And before we go any further, the name means thunder and lightning in German. The story goes that an army commander was forced to cross the river during a thunderstorm, and he was showing off his bilingual skills when he named it. Most people just call it the Blitzen, and it has incredible rafting and trout. On the other side of Steens Mountain is the Alvord Desert, an expansive salt flat where people often go to try and break land speed records. Camping is allowed on the playa, and there's also a popular hot spring nearby where you can soak and take in Steens Mountain. There's actually a ton of hot springs in the area, including this one, my favorite, which is hidden somewhere along the Owyhee River. There are at least a dozen other places in the area, and some of them you're likely to have all to yourself. Oregon's highest road goes all the way to the summit of Steens Mountain from the small village of French Glen, which also has a great little hotel and gas station. Further east, Leslie Gulch is an incredible canyon near the Owyhee Reservoir. Nearby are some impressive lava fields and beefy craters. If you venture out into the backcountry, be prepared though. When I drove out to this area in my small crossover, I got a flat tire in what might be one of the worst places in the country to get a flat. I managed to maneuver out with my donut spare, but I won't be back without a full-size spare and maybe some extra ground clearance. The Owyhee River has a reputation for incredible rafting trips, and the Owyhee Mountains are very popular with off-roaders. And the best part of all of this is that it's almost all public BLM land. You can camp almost anywhere in Southeast Oregon for up to two weeks, free, with no reservations. So yeah, this 90 mile radius is the emptiest in the lower 48 because you either got low density cattle grazing or farming, water's scarce, and that's not likely to change, but it could happen. Right now in the Coachella Valley of California, there's a massive lithium extraction process underway to harness lithium under the Salton Sea, which is similar geologically to the Alvor Desert. There are similar lithium reserves under the Alvord Desert, but as of early 2024, none of the projects to mine under the playa have gained any traction. Odds are, Southeast Oregon won't look much different in 30 years, or maybe even 100, and that's how the locals want it to be. But don't let that stop you from going and visiting the area. But yeah, that about wraps up this video, so stick around for the appendix if you want to hear about the sources I used, methodology, some other interesting content to watch and read, and some road trip planning information if you do want to take a trip up to Southeast Oregon. So that's all. Thank you for watching, everybody. Have a great day. How did I figure out which area in the U.S. has the lowest population? I use this website, Free Map Tools. They have this thing where you can find the population of a given area on the map. Truth be told, I'm not sure how accurate this is but it lets you draw like a circle. And then if you scroll down, you can click 
find population and in a couple seconds it'll tell you the population inside that circle so here we have 1800 and like i obviously i didn't test everywhere in the u.s but like if you're on an interstate highway you're gonna have a lower population or a higher population and also you can move it around i think if yeah you can move it so like let's go northeast montana for example and then you can re-click find population and it'll tell you i mean there's only so many places in the lower 48 that you can really go and be away from any like larger towns. So, like this area has 34,000 people or like central Nevada. Like feel free to go to this website here and play around with it. And you tell me maybe there is somewhere that I missed and this whole video is a lie, but I kind of doubt that. Also, yes, Burns, the town of Burns does have like 2,700 people, but it is outside the circle. There's towns outside, um, down here, Winnemucca, outside the circle. So, uh, and a lot of it's in northern Nevada, too. A lot of what I said about this video is true for this part of northern Nevada. But, like, it's such a small part of this state compared to, like, I mean, almost a, a quarter. Not really, but, like, this is just a, most of the circles in Oregon. So that's why I said Oregon. I guess the Owyhees mostly are in Idaho, too. So it's really just the northern Great Basin. This one is super pedantic. Steens Mountain, everybody says Oregon's largest fault block mountain. Um, I think it might be America, North America's largest fault block mountain. I just can't find, there's no good database of fault blocks. So like, I don't know, but I haven't been able to find one bigger. So if you guys are geologists or something, let me know. Cause that would be kind of cool if it's the biggest on the continent or in the country. While we're on the topic of Steens Mountain, if you're into like the outdoors at all, this video here, The Big Day, um, by, on Dylan Harris's channel, if I remember I'll link it in the description of this video. Really cool video about these people running all the way across the ridge of Steens Mountain, which may or may not be the largest fault block mountain on the continent, as we've discussed. So go watch this if you're into that kind of stuff. It's really good. It's well produced too. If this video has inspired you and you are really into old, rare books, I really wanted to get a copy of this book, Oregon or Harney County, Oregon and its Rangeland, um, from the fifties, but I just can't justify paying fifty bucks for this book. Um, another one in that vein is this one, Life and Death of Peter French, for like forty bucks. These are both probably really interesting. Uh, I just didn't really want to shell out the money for what could be not very good. I don't know. So yeah, if you want to learn more and, and get really deep into the history, these are good and. They're like really rare. I mean, obviously, well, not really rare, but 50 bucks. I mean, it's kind of a lot, you know. So if you do read them, let me know what you think. Okay, and lastly, if you want to take a road trip around this area, I would highly recommend it. Fly into Boise. If you don't live in the area, Boise is the closest major airport. From there, it's like, I don't know, two hours, three hours to Leslie Gulch, which is actually not that bad considering how remote this place is. You come down to Jordan Valley. I want to say there's like a motel in Jordan Valley. And then there's another one over here in French Glen, or you can stay up in Burns. Um, and then in the summertime, you can drive up to the top of Steens Mountain. Um, definitely visit in the summer. In the winter, it's pretty pretty cold. <laughs> um, and then you can go kind of around Steens and then up. Here's the Alvord Desert with the hot springs. And then on the way back to, and this would probably, you can do this in like three or four days. Um, come back up, and then you, you can either take Jordan Valley, just go back the way you came, or from Jordan Valley, you can take what's called the uh, Owyhee Uplands Backcountry Byway. If you have a nice like 4x4 rig, it's kind of just straight through the Owyhees and it cuts across near uh, like the main interstate, or 78 at least, in, in Idaho. So it kind of cuts through here and then you can come back up this way. Um, alternatively, you could come in from Bend and then you can see like the John Day fossil beds. There's a lot of cool stuff by Bend, some cool volcanoes, but in eastern Oregon, this area, there's not as much going on. Christmas Valley is an interesting town. There's actually some fun history there. And I have this point saved, crack in the ground. So there's all kinds of little stuff as you explore, you know. Up here we have um, Crane Hot Springs, which is another big one. And then tons of stuff out here. There's some, like, hot springs. I don't think you can swim in these ones, but, you know, you can definitely swim in a lot of them. And then down in the Nevada side, there's a ton of other stuff. More hot springs. There's... Um, campgrounds yeah so you get the idea there's a lot to do um road trip is great in this area but 
that's all for today. So thanks for watching the whole appendix if you did or whatever. Yeah.